Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to How to Launch an Enrollment Growth Strategy, the fifth webinar in our Enrollment Growth University webinar series. I'm Eric Olson, AVP of Marketing here at Helix Education, and today I'm joined by Chris Edwards, our VP of Strategic Partnerships. Now, despite increased competition in the online space, many institutions are still winning, and winning big. The past webinars in our series discussed different aspects of your enrollment growth strategy, including finding programmatic and geographic growth opportunities, how to optimize your enrollment operations, utilizing data intelligence to inform your student life cycle, and how to best allocate your marketing spend across channels to minimize your cost per start. And today, all that philosophy becomes practical, with Chris taking you on the final step of this roadmap and walking through practical next steps for greenlighting a growth strategy at your institution. Now, just a reminder, this webinar is based off our Enrollment Growth Playbook, and if you haven't received a copy, I highly encourage you to stop by our website after the webinar at helixeducation.com and download your free copy of the second edition with 50% brand new content on how to solve today's most pressing enrollment growth challenges. And at the end of today's webinar, we're going to leave time for questions, and there are a couple of ways for you to get involved during today's presentation. First, here in the WebEx, we'll be using the chat to accept questions during the webinar, so please type your questions at any time using that function. Second, ask questions and engage with other listeners on social media using the hashtag HelixWebinar. Additionally, we are going to be recording this presentation, and all attendees will receive a link to the recording after the webinar has ended. And now, it is my great pleasure to hand off to one of my favorite people in the world, the fantastic Chris Edwards, our VP of Strategic Partnerships here at Helix Education. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And excuse my inability to uh, operate WebEx accordingly. It's great to be with you. And as Eric mentioned, we're really excited about the next bit to talk about this final stage in the Enrollment Growth University webinar series. Um, as Eric mentioned, you know, we had some great content from Sharon, from Miranda, from Matt, Shalise and Michelle over the course of the other sessions, and I absolutely encourage you to go back and watch those sessions and bring out uh, some of the fantastic insights that they shared. Um, this link on the bottom will allow you to go to the webinar page and watch everyone on YouTube. Um, I do want to apologize in advance. This may be the only enrollment growth webinar that features the sound of construction uh, here from my beautiful office in Boston, Massachusetts. They've picked today to uh, dig up the water main in front of the office. So the sound, the ambient noise in my office today is a mix of uh, miniature earthquakes and uh, 15 lawnmowers seemingly moving in unison. So my apologies in advance if you hear anything crazy from my office. I also wanna echo Eric's point about downloading the playbook. Everything that we talk about in that playbook will really be your go forward map to implementing the strategies that we talk about today. Uh, getting together and deciding to move forward with enrollment growth is a big decision. And today as we talk about building your team and evaluating the critical aspects of moving forward with enrollment growth, uh, it's really important that you refer back to that roadmap start at the beginning and move all the way through to be able to execute on that strategy accordingly. You know, one quick reminder, at Helix, we're really about enterprise enrollment growth. And that means aligning your institution, your brand, and mission to the broader opportunities in the education space to grow. And for us, very specifically, that point of view looks out at the post-traditional space. Uh, some folks, and we like to refer to it as the adult space, Eric just made reference to online. You know, it's really important, and in our point of view, that's where the real growth is when we talk about moving forward in higher ed. Uh, but you'll hear me today use these words a little interchangeably. I'll talk about post-traditional, we'll talk about online, and we'll absolutely refer to adults. Just know that we're pointing in the same place. That opportunity that you have to grow that's not those traditional undergraduates that, for most of you, are currently off on summer break. So as Eric mentioned, our, and it's a critical question that we want to kind of address up front, are institutions still growing online? Are they growing in the adult space? And the answer is yeah, but it's exceptionally competitive out there. 
Um, in the news recently, we've heard a lot from, and Edge Adventures just sent a note today about their chief uh, higher ed online learning officers report uh, that was just released that talked about the challenges and really growing online. Um, what was known as the Babson survey, which is now the digital learning compass, uh, really showed some insight into the institutions and numbers that are growing across the sector. You know, I think it's really important for us to remember that when we talk about those who have been in uh, enrollment growth mode across this adult space, they really optimize their capacity beyond usual measures. We're not just talking about filling the usual 350 to 500 or 1,000 undergrads that come from that undergraduate recruitment cycle, nor on the graduate side are we talking about competitive processes that take a bunch of applications and fit into the best 10 students. We're really talking about having the ability to grow in capacity. And when we think about that more broadly, and as you're in the nascent stages of planning a growth effort on your campus, you absolutely need to remember that for these students, their life cycle with you should be two to three years, as opposed to the five or six or more years that some traditional undergrads spend on your campus and contribute to the mission. So when we think about growth, when we think about growth for this adult population, Remember, it's really a lot about that revenue contribution that this particular marketplace is making to boost your overall mission. Again, that's really why institutions that are in this space or that we see going into this space are taking the time, effort, and energy to try to grow and launch uh, in the adult market. Now, from our perspective, as Eric mentioned, we're seeing it. Um, you know, our partners across our managed programs are seeing an outstanding three-year growth rate. And that just reinforces to us that growth absolutely is possible in this market. You know, if you're starting a mission to build a team, to launch a growth strategy, you're in the right place. It's here. But putting everything together is going to take a lot of work. It's going to be about having everything in the right package at the right time uh, within your institution and then also reaching the market. So today, in the next 35 to 40 minutes or so, we're going to cover the three critical elements to evaluate when building your team to embark on the strategy, having the right team with the right mindset, focused on the right things, is absolutely critical for finding success. Um, and then once we've talked about that, you know, that last element, we'll dig into two possible approaches to taking action, um, whether you want to nudge your way forward in this or whether you want to go big. Uh, how we tackle innovation in higher ed has been a long, complicated story that varies from campus to campus. And Sharon talked a lot about that when we, in that very first webinar, making sure that you're able to build what you need on your campus that fits your culture is a vital part of what we'll talk about today. And you'll get a chance to look into some of the pieces that we look for um, and that you should look for in building that internal team that helps you reach success. And so, um, Eric mentioned the Enrollment Growth Playbook. Um, he neglected to mention the subtitle for Volume 2, which is uh, Bigger, Better, and Growier, uh, which is a fantastic subtitle. Uh, I like a good subtitle, and so today it's how to launch an enrollment growth strategy, but really we're digging into three critical questions to ask when building your team. Um, as you think about taking the strategy forward, you read the playbook, you understand the market trends, and you know you've got to take action but there's no way to do it by yourself. So in building that functional team, what do you have to look for? What are those critical items? That's really what we're gonna dig into today as we get into the meat of the webinar. So that very first question, who on my campus has that fit factor? And when we talk about fit factor, there's a couple things. One is when we're thinking about growth, the importance of institutional fit. And frankly, um, we saw it in the headlines today. So in Inside Higher Ed this morning in the daily update, which I got in my email box, which you should get in your email box too, um, there was a story uh, about the University of Dallas and their kind of institutional wrestling with uh, the desire to move forward into adult degree completion, something that they've been pondering over the last year. Um, there were some really big questions on campus around if that effort fit into the mission of teaching and learning, not only in the campus environment, but what's actually coming through in the curriculum. 
Um, that's one of the critical things that I think everybody needs to evaluate as they figure out this broader mission, but it really points to the fact that before embarking on this, or as you embark on this, you absolutely have to continue to take the heartbeat of your institution. As you're building a team, the players there must understand what's critical to your campus in order to make sure that you're building forward in success. And frankly, Sharon talks a lot about that in the very first webinar we did, so I very much encourage you to go back and look at it. So when we talk about evaluating fit factor, uh, when you think about the folks on your team that you want to work with, a lot of what you see on the screen are kind of standard innovation things. You want folks with a growth mindset. You want them to be collaborative, data-driven, student-centered, innovative, and you've got to have strong leadership on your team. You know, at Helix, when we talk to potential partners about moving forward with them in the market, they see this as probably the most important thing we look for. Uh, I'd argue that today, in this context, what you're looking for are the characteristics to help build your team and think about these six critical elements that would be distributed across the players on those teams. Um, now, one of the other items I think is important to know, and we'll break those down individually in a second, those characteristics are both internal and external. So remember with this adult market, your outcomes are gonna be exceptionally different. You're gonna to want to grow with inside your community, within, within the region that you live in in order to get early success in building out your adult enrollment growth strategy. So from a practical perspective, you absolutely need to make sure that the team that you're looking for has the ability to look internally with these characteristics, but are ready to express them outside the bounds of the grounds as I'm calling it out in your broader community where for an adult student or a post-traditional student or an online student, the outcomes they need absolutely exist. So let's break down those characteristics really quickly when you're looking for a team. The first one is a growth mindset. And when we think about that in the adult context and we look for potential teammates to join our group to help move an initiative forward on campus, the first kind of aspect of that has to be that willingness to increase capacity for doing the required things in the student life cycle. Um, it's simple operational things, but starting more often, uh, packaging financial aid more quickly, taking in more applications and making decisions faster. Uh, that aspect of growth can be difficult for many campuses. And finding folks on your team who both understand the need for that in the adult market, which Miranda talks about a lot in the second webinar, and folks who can do it with the tech, and you heard a little bit about that from Matt in webinar three, having the opportunity to do that and finding those folks who understand those characteristics are vital. Um, the second is being able to open up and be flexible around delivering your academic distinctives and your institutional distinctives in new formats and methods. Um, it's important to know that for us, that's equal to the same outcomes, but if you go back to that story we referenced earlier with the University of Dallas, there were some real challenges there from campus around integrating some of those core courses in their undergraduate curriculum into their broader degree completion curriculum. We've seen that in institutions that have that core concept. It's a really good critical conversation to have. Uh, for a lot of folks, having that growth mindset means making sure that what you have can equal the same outcomes that you have on campus today. And the third really big thing is thinking with the market in mind. So remember that adult students are looking for job outcomes by and large, what they can see on their campus where they can see it. So in their local community, their concerns are different than your traditional undergrad. So when you think about how you grow, it's important to, again, look outside the bounds and the grounds to make sure that you can make that happen. The second characteristic is being collaborative. And I think that collaboration really comes into play for folks who can work together across the student life cycle and build bridges to the broader community across the entire campus. Um, there's a level of collaboration that's required to get the innovation and speed in your processes that you need. So when you're looking for folks to join the team, those folks who have a broad understanding of what you're doing across the student life cycle from the initial raise of hand through that critical application, packaging, decision, registration component, making sure that folks on your team understand the need to collaborate and to communicate across those departments is vital. Um, and probably the biggest aspect there is leveraging give and take. Um, understand that in some ways exploring this growth strategy means building out new capabilities that you'll use 
specifically over here in this adult online world. Um, it's almost like a second business, quote unquote, to what you're doing with your traditional undergrads. So there is a level of give and take that's required on a campus. No one is set up perfectly to be able to flip the switches on and get the kind of efficiencies right away. So those two businesses have to collaborate and have to trade. There's definitely a sense of give and take. Now, that third piece is being data-driven. And the most important part of a solid adult strategy today is being data-driven. And frankly, that means being data-driven absolutely everywhere on campus. So in looking to build your team, you've got to find folks who are willing to ask these questions, to talk to the folks who are gathering data, who are delivering courses, um, who are involved in this life cycle once a class has started, who are involved in re-registration, and ensure that you're collecting the right data in every step of the way. Uh, in webinar four, three, three, Matt talked about a data story, having your institutional data story and understanding where it is and how it is structured so that you can get better at setting up the right conditions for students to be successful. And doing that oftentimes means looking hard at yourself and making sure that you have the right situation to be successful. So from that perspective, making sure that you're able to collect data from that very raise of hand to integrate critical systems, and probably most importantly, have the courage to ask these questions across campus in an environment where you may not have asked those questions before, and folks might be wondering if you've got some sort of alternative motive, uh, making sure that you're able to get that information into your decision-making quickly and easily. And frankly, the next level to that once you're gathering all that data is now how personal and relevant can we make the campus experience to you? You want folks on your team who have the ability to think about and execute on those data-driven principles. Next is being student-centered. And again, just like collecting data, there's a level of being student-centered all across the life cycle that manifests itself in a different way. Um, remember, you're dealing with students who may not physically be there with you on campus. So thinking through all of these critical items uh, from afar and ensuring that, that you can do these things successfully from a distance is a critical part of the mindset it takes to look across that framework of folks that you have on campus and find the right folks to be on your team. Uh, you'll notice that instructor interaction is highlighted here. And this may be the most critical part of addressing the strategy up front. Um, as we all know, teaching an online course for folks the very first time of teaching adults, it's different. It feels different. There's different rhythms. There's different ways of delivering material. Uh, it's different than what you might do in your traditional classroom, sans technology, or even in a hybrid approach where you're using your learning management system effectively. Making sure that your team has someone who uh, has the connections across campus to really work with not only the academic side of things, but instructor interaction is vital for your long-term success. You know, we often see in those end-of-term reviews and the surveys, which like them or not, they're still the best way to gather data about how things went, uh, the instructor interaction in an online course is a critical uh, happiness factor for those students. So there's definitely a right way to be interactive in a course. You've got to make sure that it's happening in the course. And you want folks on your team from the start who are able to address that with confidence and the kind of credibility you need. Fifth, there's a level of innovation. And I want to stop here and really encourage caution around innovation as it comes to an adult strategy. Um, for me, and as uh, what we see here at Helix and what we see in the broader industry for folks who are successful here, um, being innovative is getting your institution up to the industry standard, very simply put. Uh, it means having the kind of turnaround times and experiences that students want and expect from a consumer perspective. Um, it continues with being able to make adjustments quickly based on all that stuff you're gathering in the data stage. And it really only gets into this brand new, we're the first at this particular awesome thing, only after you've done steps one and two. Um, we had, over the last couple of years in our space, uh, in reaching adult students, this idea that 
moving to competency-based education was a good thing, and we're all for it. Uh, the use of outcomes and rubrics and the idea that those outcomes are mapped to the curriculum are fantastic, and most campuses, many campuses, need to continue to innovate in that way and continue to bake that into absolutely everything you deliver from a curriculum perspective. But from a business side, competency-based education in the adult market had a tough go. Um, certainly, there are aspects of executing on that that were really difficult for institutions to do, not to mention the default price points that were set in the market for those particular programs. And so I caution thinking too far outside the box when entering and growing in this particular marketplace in this stage of the game. Innovation here is really about taking those incremental steps to make sure that what you're doing is moving forward in a positive way. And that last thing is strong leadership. So again, when building out that team and thinking about strong leadership, it's a couple things. It's an individual effort for folks on your team who have the kind of insight across all those areas. You really don't get that kind of input and uh, expertise on a campus unless you're uh, a strong leader, right? Unless you've shown yourself to be faithful and to do good work on other projects. It's also a group effort. And so Sharon, again, talks a lot in that first webinar about the cultural things that you need to do on a campus with any change effort to get the kind of consensus required to move forward in a really tough environment. And so from a group perspective, it's really vital as you work those things through that you keep your eye on the mission and make sure that you're aligned moving ahead. And probably most importantly, it's an external effort. Um, we'll talk a little bit and reinforce points that Shalise and Michelle made about where your strategy needs to be for this adult growth. Um, and then looking really closely to where you are, uh, building this effort in your community is vital. Um, it's about making those connections, not only internally, but also externally. And so when we think about that, from the very start, um, there's a couple of things that, that each little innovative area really needs to focus on when we talk about those particular areas. Um, one is looking at the broader employment market of your region. You may not do that today with your undergrads, but your students in this adult population are coming to you from where you are. So thinking about that employment market, what that means, and taking those things that students learn and mixing and matching them to what's required for, you know, good community growth. That's a really important part of what you're going to do here. Um, from a student-centered perspective, thinking about outcomes and leveraging that flexibility in the curriculum, maybe it's in partnerships you're building with big employers along the way, or maybe it's something that needs to be developed in your neck of the woods. Um, being able to think about those outcomes and make sure that you're leveraging flexibility is vital. And frankly, there are times where programs, disciplines, content needs to be remixed to stay relevant and continue to contribute to your mission. So there might be some programs from a long ago effort in the adult space that you made that aren't as relevant today uh, or things that might need to be remixed or need to go. And finally, as I mentioned before, I can't emphasize enough the idea that strong leadership for everyone across campus is absolutely critical in order to make sure that something like this moves forward. Um, these are critical resources that you're putting towards a, a critical marketplace that has a lot of needs that are different from your traditional students. And so making sure that you've got that leadership in place is absolutely vital. Now, there's a sub-question here. Uh, when we talk about building a team and looking at those growth factors and the fit factor and what you need to have to be part of that team, um, my favorite sub-question of all, how big should the team be? Um, one of the critical things you've got to remember is that as we think practically about the areas on campus that must change, uh, there's three. One is the enrollment retention life cycle. It's very different from what you do today. Um, there's processes inside that life cycle that must change and face forward. And then the technology that powers the life cycle has to be reviewed. Um, for a lot of folks and a lot of campuses, this could be an absolute ton of people. Oh, and there's one more, um, filling the budgets. Um, I understand that the most practical folks that you might have on your team may not have the authority to fill that budget right away. Um, when we talk about growth in the adult space, you're spending a lot more by and large than you are traditionally with those undergrads that know where you are and you know where they are and it's just a matter of deciding where you're at. It's very much a consumer space. So when we think about all those areas of change, we could get into a lot of people on campus. I'd argue and caution that 
Um, the two pizza rule is vital. And I'm sure you've all heard about the two pizza rule. This is Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, uh, who says on campus at Amazon, you know, two pizzas. You can never have a meeting where two pizzas can't feed the entire group. Um, that's a critical thing, I think, for uh, moving forward with an initiative once you have your team. You can build a great team, you can do awesome stuff, but if you don't mind this two pizza rule, uh, things will get bogged down pretty quickly. I also want to make sure that we understand that in this particular case, in higher ed, I'm also talking about committees. Um, and it's not okay to do some of the things you see on the right side of the screen. We're not talking about two sheet pizzas here, which is a, one of my favorites from way up in Western New York. You can't expand the, ro the, the size of your committee and the size of your group so big that it's impossible to make decisions. And we're not talking about personal pan pizzas either which are a fantastic thing, but not appropriate here. It has to be the right size group in order to figure out how to move forward. So again, two pizzas, depending on how much pizza you eat and how big those pizzas are, think about the six to eight people that you need to have cross-discipline on your campus to be able to move forward with something like this, a broad growth initiative. Have those people with the right pieces of the fit factor and the right aspects to who they are, and you'll have success in question one of driving forth an enrollment growth strategy. Now question two, how on earth do we determine viability for our strategy? And a, a big reminder here is that you're moving into, you know, that prominent business term, the 800 pound gorillas of the space, and there are many, uh, they're established, they're hungry for growth, they have a lot of cash, and they need and want to support their institutional objectives and ambitions. And in today's marketplace, that's not just the for-profit publicly traded companies that are in and have specialized in adult learning for all this time. The nonprofit players are there too, and the bigger you get, the more you need to feed the enterprise. And so no matter what you do, no matter when you enter, you're going to enter with these folks in the space. So how do you balance that? It's really important to measure your own institutional viability. These are the critical points. You must, 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 and the playbook talks about this, Michelle and Shalise talked about this, measure market trends and needs. Uh, it's got to be relevant to you in your local community from an academics and population perspective to make sense. If it's not, throw caution. You absolutely positively have to think regional. That's regional around your campus, right? No more than 100 to 150 miles in a circle from where you are as the primary place where people are likely to know who you are and what you do and have an interest in having that discipline from you. You know, I run into institutions all the time who, especially here in the Northeast, where the population is very dense, where when we talk about the undergraduate enrollment strategy, I hear very often that the student population there at the campus is coming from a 10 to 15 mile radius around campus, which is amazing to me. But also at those campuses for anyone considering an adult strategy, gosh, if you're only recruiting your undergraduates from a 10 to 15 mile radius and they tend to stay put, your adult brand and your institutional brand will be pretty narrow as well. So you must, must, must think regionally and make sure that those trends are where you want them to be. You've also got to align your academic plans to meet market needs. Sharon talked about this in earlier webinars, and the book talks about this, where you must, must make sure that the programs that you're offering are actually for the folks in your area. You may have a particular set of expertise, but if it's not something that folks in your region can use, the program will not grow as you want it to, and it doesn't help you meet that particular mission. And then from a viability perspective, planning step-by-step step to be best in class in the important operational areas from the minute you raise your hand through the application decision conferment into financial aid and then through uh, starting classes, retention, and the kind of coaching interaction, um, making sure that that's something that you can do. And a critical question there is where do we build that capacity? Um, where do we have that capacity that we can repurpose as we're getting started? And when do we buy that capacity? And I provide, I guess, a, another note of caution here when we talk about build versus buy. Um, know that it's going to take a little time to get these areas ramped on your campus. So 
you don't have to build the whole building right away or the whole infrastructure today in terms of people operation uh, when you're not necessarily sure exactly what the volume will be through your programs. Take that mindset of being able to adjust, of being flexible and having that growth mindset to start and make changes as you go along the way. And, and there might be some places where you have to ramp quickly in places where you need to, to partner. And that's a critical aspect of how you might approach this as well. All that said, and we go back to our friend, Mr. Bezos, and kind of his market wisdom, you may make all the right plans, but there still could be a big disruption in your way. And I point to an article from last week's Wall Street Journal where around the Seattle area, uh, Amazon has taken to giving away bananas. I don't know if anybody saw this or not. Um, it's not about the money in the banana stand, but uh, if you're in greater and downtown Seattle, you can basically stroll up to a cart and get a banana from Amazon free. Now, that's caused a lot of disruption in the banana market. It's really difficult, according to the article, to find bananas in the supermarket because Amazon's buying them all. And for folks right next to the banana stand, as you can see on the screen, you know, this particular cafe was offering bananas as a topping for a dollar on their yogurt and doing really well until Amazon showed up and, and brought in free bananas. Uh, note the flexibility in the growth mindset in that second paragraph, though. The cafe had to change its banana strategy. So now there's banana-based vegan eggnog and chocolate banana drink, and those are hits because bananas are on the brain. Um, the bottom line in all of that is that no matter what you do, the market that you're entering has big, bold players, and you're going to have to adjust as you move forward uh, with the strategy that you take in order to be successful no matter what. Um, so don't let that scare you, but also realize that the makeup of that team, those first questions we answered, are absolutely critical in having a strategy that will make sense and work. So those are the first two questions. This last one is critical as well. And it's really about what approach we take to launch the strategy. What do we need to do? We've got a team. We've determined our viability. We understand kind of where we think we are. Um, what do we need to do to launch? And, and I guess the first thing here is a, a warning. Um, launching the strategy, it's not about upending your institution. We're not talking at this stage about the latest pedagogical innovation like CBE, which we talked about earlier. And we're not talking about the buzzy student success solutions that people bring across the enterprise that are hot today, which tend to fall into a implementation strategy that's not good here, where you're piloting for a year and then the launch plan seems to take forever. What we're really talking about is alignment, changing and aligning those resources and areas of the student experience that require a different approach for this audience. And, you know, like, as I mentioned a couple times, Sharon in Webinar 1 really talks about the need to manage that change across the institution to make sure that you're building the kind of rapport and buy-in that's going to align folks behind your broader goal. And we've seen a lot of folks, both our partners and potential partners we've worked with, do this successfully. It's an important part of how you go about establishing this level of change as you launch and some of the decisions that you'll need to make. So. One more reminder before we get to the two approaches you need to look at, we're really talking about those three and a half critical areas of change when you're launching your strategy to start within your enrollment retention cell life cycle, within those critical processes, and potentially with the technology that powers it, and then the budgets that enable all of that, but then also provide that power at the top of the funnel. Those are the areas as you get ready to launch the strategy that must be equally, if not doubly important as what's happening on the curricular side of things as you're making those investments over there. Um, it's all got to come together. And as Sharon mentions again in webinar one, you've got to make sure that you're doing that holistically across campus to build buy-in that basically matches your culture. But from a, a practical perspective, if you're launching the strategy, you've got our playbook in hand, uh, making sure that you're focused on these three and a half critical areas as you move forward is vital. So when you sit and think about it, again, playbook in hand, team ready to go, viability measured, there's two approaches. Um, one is the opportunity to nudge your way to success, um, figuring out how to make small incremental movements towards having the resources necessary to build the strategy. Um, that's a way that many campuses are choosing to go, um, and it definitely is one that 
may not grow as fast as you want it to, or you might need it to, given your current campus environment, but something that after you've built your team and figured out your viability, you absolutely have to do. So, if that's the case, there's a couple critical things you've got to watch out for. If you're going to nudge, you've got to nudge the right way. And there's four critical nudges we're going to go over here. Uh, the first nudge is inquiry versus apply. So, if you're growing in the space, your website absolutely must encourage your adult student to raise their hand in the most simple way possible. Today, when you visit a lot of campuses that are considering the strategy, their website just asks folks if they want to apply. You know, the old inquiry form for undergraduate students is gone by the wayside. That's a complete 360 from the way you need to operate in this space. You must, must, must encourage those students to raise their hand because they're ready to go and you're building your brand with them and you need to establish that communication, but you have gotta have that funnel and pipeline of those students in order to build out a predictable enterprise, right? It's not predictable that these adult students are just gonna show up on your doorstep in August like your traditional undergrad. So you absolutely must make sure that folks can inquire. And for that, you're gonna have to go to your web folks and encourage them to build out the appropriate properties on the page and set up the right workflows so that that adult student can find what they need to and raise their hand when they come to you. That is probably the most critical small step that many campuses can make when considering a growth strategy for adults. You've got to sort this out, and that team you have needs to be well connected on the tech and process side to help make that happen. The second nudge is a little bit more simple. Um, you've got to be able to call somebody. So many institutions that are considering a growth strategy may have existing programs in place. And when you go to those program pages, you see to contact someone, email some generic email address. In today's attention marketplace, for the kind of response that you've got to have for someone who's ready to go to school, grad program at myschool.edu is not going to cut it. So that second nudge from your team in the nudge strategy has to be for each program making sure there's someone who's on top of whenever somebody gets to you who can respond quickly, engage in a dialogue, and make sure that you can move people through. That's very much in the enrollment life cycle process point of view, but it's a must, right? Have folks that are able to do that or have teams that are going to able to do that. But again, we're nudging here. So identify those folks, make them available, and make sure that they know that it's a priority to ensure that you reach out. The third nudge we've got really relates back to curriculum. So if taking this incremental approach You've got programs today that are quote unquote online um, that might be a part of your program, that might be a part of the degree that you're gonna offer. And your ability there to ensure that those online programs absolutely meet the requirements of an adult learner is a must. Just because it's in your LMS course shell doesn't mean that it's what it needs to be in order to facilitate success for that adult learner. And maybe the biggest one is identifying the time it takes on tasks to complete specific items from readings to videos to quizzes to otherwise, uh, having that clearly identified in courses is probably the number one thing that helps adult learners who are balancing jobs, kids, family, life, and school. Um, time is an asset to them that they really value and that they plan out very much. So your third nudge, if taking this slowly, is to start to evaluate with your instructional design staff and best practices ways to make sure that you're consistently preventing, presenting this information in those courses. That will make those course shells and that content more evergreen and more doable for the kinds of things you're gonna launch, um, and also give you the ability to start to infuse best practices for adult learners within your workflow, a critical part of having success. And the last nudge, delivering your campus well. So remember, for adult students, by and large, what they see of you is not your brick and mortar campus or the satellite location that you have in some conference room in some office building or 25 miles away or down the street. Uh, for today's adult learner, where there's growth, it tends to be online. And to be online, you've got to ensure that your systems are up and available. Uh, for a lot of campuses, that does start with the learning management system, ensuring that it is up and available all the time and supported uh, in the hours that folks are going to access it. So that tends to be, again, for adult students, nights and weekends. Um, 
having that support, which might be available through your LMS, critical, making sure that it's not down for extended periods of time. Again, it's the classroom, and you've got to ensure that students are able to attend that class. So you want to ensure that that particular piece is front-facing and has the kind of support it needs. Then, once you're there, it's important to think about self-service. How can adult students self-service in registration, the portal, looking through your student information system, um, financial aid, uh, birth star information? What can students do outside of setting foot on your campus? Being able to make that as self-service as possible is the fourth big nudge that you can take in order to ensure that you're ready to go on a growth strategy. Now, we've talked about nudging which is a critical way to go about things. Again, if you've done and followed the steps, you've got a team, and nudging is really the only way you can go. But for many who start on this journey, they're thinking about going big. They think they're ready to go, and institutions have the right intangibles. You've done all that work correctly. You've looked at the playbook, and you're ready to take action. Here's the critical checklist that you need in order to make sure that you're ready to launch and go big. First, can you make that first phone call within a minute? When we go back to Miranda's session, she talks about the life cycle and the fact that in this particular marketplace, making that call to that inquiry, which you're capturing on the regular, needs to be within the first minute. So can we do that? Are we ready to go there? The second piece in the checklist, is our data story solid? And do we have a technology strategy for the entire of the student life cycle? Having that thought out and having those building blocks put in place and having the resources available to connect those is vital to be able to follow up on number one. Shalise and Michelle talked about having a budget and mindset for investing in marketing. Shalise talked a lot about Google in her session where, uh, as we all know, um, advertising with Google, a brand search, organic search is the best way to attract folks to a website that needs to be functional, to a process that needs to work, but that also takes dollars and cents. So do we have that budget and mindset? Have we been able to figure out what we want to invest in order to get the kind of conversion necessary. And then do we have all the resources to do this ourselves? Do we have the time to spare? Are we ready to go? And do we have the buy-in to affectionately operationalize this plan? Uh, those are four critical questions if considering going big that you absolutely need to make sure you have answered before you put a dollar into the market. Um, if you've got those answered and you're ready to go and you've built the right team, and you know your viability, you'll have the goals and you'll have the objectives that you need to really deliver on a successful enrollment growth strategy. And with that, I turn it back to Eric to find out what questions have been asked. Eric? Chris, thanks so much. Really, really good stuff here. Uh, lots of great comments and questions coming into the back channel um, that, that we're thanking you and us for um, um, some some practical tips in helping them move forward, as well as I think some realizations of, boy, um, you know, some of the marketing stuff that we chatted about in the last webinars were fun. Uh, th that was the fun stuff. This was the hard part, getting institutional right. buying and, and, and moving forward. Um, but it was really helpful for me, and I think uh, I think a lot of the, the listeners as well. So I, I'm going to jump in to, to some questions if you're ready for them. Yeah, I'm ready. Perfect. Uh, first one that came in, what types of institutions are best suited to win and compete against those 800-pound gorillas like you mentioned in the online space moving forward? You know, the best institutions, I think, are the ones that, A, have the want to, but B, have the wherewithal to build a strategy that makes sense. Um, and I say that, I realize that's not a very specific answer, but hang with me for a minute. You know. The idea that the strategy you need to have in the space is going to take a couple of years to fully mature into the kind of revenue that you need to support and grow the institutional mission, that's a critical realization. So from that perspective, if you think strategically about how you set your goals, um, you really are the kind of institution that can be successful. I think more practically, Institutions that are able to properly address that population we refer to so many times of adults that do not have their credential but have some college, um, those institutions are ones that are well prepared to succeed. But I say that with a caveat in that most institutions today who are considering a strategy don't by default have the infrastructure it takes to grow instantly. 
there's some process that has to happen around things like transfer credits and financial aid and application and admit processes that need to be refined and tightened to your mission in order to make that successful. But, you know, by and large, the kind of institution that wants to be successful here is the kind of institution that can be successful. You've just got to be really careful about what your definition of success is. Love it. Good stuff, Chris. And for all our attendees and participants, feel free to use the chat functionality if you have additional questions you'd like Chris to respond to since we have a little extra time. But I'm going to jump right into the next one. Chris, there's a great deal of desire to grow at my institution. We have a growth mindset, like you mentioned, but not a whole lot of willingness to take bold moves or make the hard decisions necessary to get there. And I think it's because we don't have clarity or absolute confidence about a successful way forward because we haven't been incredibly successful in that adult online space in the past. Any recommendations for helping to create a wake-up call on campus? I think they're referring to themselves being that uh, agent of change without coming across antagonistically or as a bully. Sure. You know, there's plenty of institutions who have been in and around the adult space in the last 10 to 15 years who may have had great success at one time, but then, you know, market conditions or just natural momentum or maybe the economy or the program mix fell off and it's just not as successful as it used to be. Um, that's okay. I do think that for many institutions, it, you were kind of in a new reality. And if we look at the last 10 years of population growth of market growth of job growth or not um, and what the economy has done it, it's really a new time across higher ed in a lot of ways so the, probably the best way forward is to make sure from a research perspective you have a strong understanding of what that market might be uh, that may be taking the formal step of commissioning a feasibility study around what's happening in your area and what might be available for you from an adult perspective um, being really mindful that you've got to potentially get some research on campus in order to show the value of the opportunity before folks will listen and buy in. Um, that's a totally natural approach to think that, gosh, well, we did that before and it was terrible. It's not going to work again. Um, the idea that you try and try again in this particular space will, will require a makeover, but you absolutely can be successful if you're uh, mindful to set the right approach from the start. Um, I absolutely recommend looking at the playbook from start to finish. You know, when we talk about establishing those goals and doing that market scan, is probably the first way to help build the strategy on campus. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Next one, what are the most common mistakes you see institutions making when trying to commit to an adult online growth strategy? Oh, golly. So maybe the biggest one is having outsized expectations. Um, you know, if your expectations are that this is going to be a complete campus saver instantly or will contribute a ton up front or that the volume of students is going to be just crazy, um, you want to recheck those assumptions. Um, I think that's a critical part of, of just establishing the right point of view moving forward. Um, you know, moving forward from there, it just making sure that, again, you've got everything on your side aligned um, and that you've got the right mindset and point of view, uh, that's really the way that you're going to be able to drive success. Love it. And, and a great question just came in from Laura McLean, um, and she is one that, that, Chris, I know we deal with uh, often uh, with our partner institutions. Her question is, we have made tremendous growth with adult um, uh, education. However, our issues arise with assisting adult learners with funding because many have attended college before and may be reaching their aggregate loan level or may have defaulted on loans. What's our position or advice on that, or can you recommend foundations and or supporters of adult learners? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think for that, the first place that I would start is, again, in your local community. You know, I think the critical aspect of taking a regional approach to growing an adult is that the folks that we're trying to help are in our neck of the woods. They work here. They live here. Um, they're, they want to grow here. They need to have jobs here and find job growth here. All of those things are particularly critical for folks in a local area. So. You know, it's a particularly vexing challenge for many institutions who are trying to grow online, who uh, run into students that have challenges with 
loan limits, you know, they've borrowed everything they can borrow, they've gone to other institutions, they're just, they're particularly challenged in that area. Uh, I would encourage institutions to really look to build those public-private partnerships within your neck of the woods and make sure that your marketplace understands that your adult growth is really for your community. You know, oftentimes we hear institutions that want to take an online strategy and people think, oh, online, well, that means national. That means folks from Florida and Texas and California and New York when we might be in Indiana. And the reality of that is the complete opposite, but it just doesn't make a ton of sense to kind of the generalized populace who sees you trying to go online. So that's where that evangelism of your efforts comes into play. For institutions that their mission is degree completion, you know, we know that adult learners want that outcome, and that outcome needs to be a, a better job in a lot of cases or growth in their employment. That's the number one thing. So making sure that your local community institutions are aware of what you're doing. There's a number of good private partnerships that we've seen across the country from labor unions providing last mile support um, to community foundations providing kind of broader and bigger items. It will be foundations in your neck of the woods that make the most success and make the most impact, but that's absolutely where I'd look to help really establish a priority in getting those students some additional funding. Thanks, Chris. And you brought up that concept a couple times today, so I do want to stay on it for a second. It almost seems as if you were pitching online as a modality versus this uh, you know, shortcut to national growth. And, and then that concept, when you were talking about the concept of, of if you're looking to grow, think regionally, not nationally, that got a lot of attraction in the, in the back channel on Twitter. Uh, can, can you stay on that just for a second in terms of helping us understand when we're going online, we have a lot of faculty at our institution who are excited about, great, now, you know, we're just not just Illinois anymore, we're going to get those California kids. Um, and and the, the reality might be, no, we've made our educational offering extraordinarily accessible to still our local audience who knows us and has that brand recognition. Yeah, I think that's an important thing. You know, when we talk about growing recruitment today, the undergraduate narrative absolutely is let's go other places. So we've seen institutions go where the population might be um, undergraduate institutions from the heartland recruiting in California because that's where the undergraduate student growth is going to be. So you send recruiters to Cali and you're trying to have folks from all 50 states. Like all those strategies are very valid from an undergrad perspective. But again, when we think about when we think about the adult market, when we think about online, um, you can get in that space. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, you can decide that you want to go nationally, but whatever you set aside from a budget perspective is going to evaporate in a heartbeat. And so it just costs so much to play in that space today. Uh, and if you have questions about that, I mean, you can go look at the publicly available um, income statements from for-profit institutions who are doing this that focus primarily on this adult learner and just see how much they spend. Um, you know, you kind of get a sense of how much that costs per student is, if that's worthwhile. You know, it really is online as a modality and online as a missional exercise in that, remember, you know, the adult student playbook 10 years ago was let's build a bunch of branch campuses within 30 miles of our campus so that people can drive to those campuses and, you know, take the classes there. That also was built on this cohort model where, look, we've got to start five or six or seven students in those programs in order to make it financially viable for us, which means if I don't have five or six or seven, I'm going to make people wait. And that's probably two, that's probably the biggest thing that folks don't want today. One is they don't want to wait to get started with their classes. And two, they don't want to wait in traffic, any traffic ever. I hate traffic, you hate traffic, we all hate traffic. If you live in some of these cities like Salt Lake where we're based or Denver or Austin, Texas, where you'd think they don't have traffic, not like Los Angeles. Oh, they certainly do. Um, so you're, if you're very rural and 20 miles means 20 minutes and you're not going to encounter anybody on the way, you might get people from a 20-mile radius. But frankly, today with the things that most people are balancing in order to study, they just, I mean, 10 miles away from you is 10 miles away from you, and that's exceptionally difficult to do on a weeknight basis for an adult learner. So. Yeah, when we talk about online, it's definitely a different point of view. It's being able to eliminate that weight 
a lot of times so students can get started more quickly in their programs because we set up the right schedule. Uh, it eliminates that weight of having to drive to campus on a Wednesday night and sit for three hours in the classroom in a cohort of people that frankly will dwindle over time because they're just not growing the way they need to. Um, and it helps us shift our work. You know, with an online class and that modality, it allows the adult learner to take advantage of the time they do have control over, which tends to be, and speaking as an adult learner, Friday night, Saturday all day, and Sunday all day. You're dealing with a population that's basically giving up their weekends for a two and a half to three year period. You know, when they think about the thing that they can do to make their life better, um, this is it, right? And it takes precedence over home repair or spending a lot of time with their kids at the park or some of these other things. So that's really where, when you think about online today, that's really where online fits and sits in this, in this paradigm. So I think it's really important to make sure that you evangelize those realities. A successful program is going to involve being online. It's very simply a matter of making sure that, you know, that online context and what that means for you is really established on your campus and that your stakeholders inside and out understand what you're doing, right? This is not your, this is not a play to bring people from a thousand miles away. It's a play to make sure that you're dominating that 150 miles as the place to grow educationally in my neck of the woods. Thanks, Chris, really good stuff. And I think with that, we're gonna give you back a couple minutes of your day. Thank you all so very much for attending how to launch an enrollment growth strategy. Again, we'll be sending the materials from this webinar to all participants afterward, so you can share this deck and presentation with anyone at your institution that needs to hear this content. And now's a great time to head to our website, helixeducation.com, to download your free copy of the second edition of the Enrollment Growth Playbook. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you next time.